1984, uh, Paul Starr, who many of you in this room may know, wrote a pretty influential book called The Social Transformation of American Medicine. Uh, just curious, how many of you have read that book? Okay, three of you, four of you. But read this book, because the first sentence of this book is actually, it sets the stage for everything that we're going to talk about today, and it's as follows. The dream of reason did not take power into account. Think about that for healthcare. The dream of reason did not take power into, the, in, into account. It's reasonable to expect that we would have a patient-centered healthcare system. It's reasonable to expect that we could develop products and tools that were built around the patient instead of maximizing revenue. But what we have is a morass of competing interest in healthcare, where oftentimes what's good for one person isn't good for the patient. Behind me, you may recall from your eighth grade Greek mythology, uh, Sisyphus. And as Carrie and I have learned in studying Sisyphus greatly in preparation for this talk, uh, this is actually a pretty morbid story that we won't bore you with, but I will say that you can recall the basic principle of Sisyphus, which is that he was working on getting this big boulder up to the top of a mountain. And then every time he would get close to the top, it would roll back down. And every day, he'd have to start the process over and over and over and over again. Think about change in healthcare. Think about what we're up against. Think about what we see and experience every day as providers and as patients. And think about Sisyphus. This is why we need to flatten the healthcare hierarchy. It's beyond a time in healthcare where it's just about power and money. It's actually about the patient. As he hands the microphone to the patient. So could you progress one more? The slide. Oh, so we're going from one rock, the important rock. I mean, he's talking about Greek mythology. This is a rock at the top of a mountain in Maine. It's called Bubble Rock, and it's uh, around Jordan Pond, if anyone's ever been to Acadia Park in Maine. This is where that is. And you look at this, and you say, how on earth did this giant boulder get to the top of this mountain, and it's dangling off? I mean, that's pretty complex stuff. I, I think that we're taking Sisyphus's rock, and we're sticking it at the top of a mountain. I don't want to think in terms of you know, who has to own this problem, but it's better to think in terms of who can solve this problem. So as a patient, I've been living with type 1 diabetes for 27 years. I look at this and I don't say, oh, I want to blame everyone. It's the doctors, it's the system, it's, it's me. It's a combination of all of those things. I think it's now finally time, flattening the healthcare system, right? We don't want to flatten it. We want to steamroll it. We want to find ways for, for us to be talking to one another to figure out not so much how the rock ended up in the first place up at the top of this mountain, but how can we get it down safely and achieve better health for everyone? Okay, so let's think about some numbers for a minute. If you think, if you think about, thank you for like the two people that get to like the slide. If you think about how much money we spend in healthcare, okay, I don't need to tell this to you all, you know this. It's about, you know, 18% of our GDP. When we look at specifically how much it costs per capita, we're about at $8,000 per capita now compared to other countries where it's $2,000. And you ask, well, what do we get for this? And I know we're often proud of saying this, but we're number 37. And if you look at where we rank in overall you know, performance measures across the world in healthcare, we're not doing that great. But we're doing really well at some things. And this is where I think we have an opportunity within this dialogue, within this discussion, to talk about all these numbers that we know, all these huge problems that exist out there. Hey, let me give you one more. Um, studies have come out that show by the year 2020, it's when the first time average household medium incomes cross the average healthcare premium, meaning people will make less than what their healthcare premium will be. So that's a huge problem, right? And it's a problem that if we truly believe that healthcare is worth saving, what does it need to become? Different numbers. So patients generally don't think in, think in terms of, you know, these are the statistics of how many people are using what healthcare system and how much it costs us globally or as a country. As patients, we're dealing with the minutia of different numbers. This is a photo of just a couple different blood glucose results that I've gotten on my meter. And for anyone who might be a healthcare professional in this room who's judging these numbers, stop doing it right now. This isn't for that, okay? So I was 300 because I was. We're just going to let that part go. But thank you. But it's, it's more in terms of these little numbers, the minutia of it matters to us. So whether it's the glucose result that we're looking at, some people think, you know, healthcare providers might be looking at this saying, Glad that you tested. It's important that you know these numbers, but I don't think that they realize that we're acting on these numbers, even if that action is inaction. By looking at the number in the bottom corner, 78, any given moment of the day, that could be a number that I need to treat. That could be a number that I need to correct with insulin. I'm not correct with insulin. 
uh, watch to make sure I'm not going too low. These are numbers that they're not just little results on a meter. These are things that really matter to us. And then looking at a bigger scale, the numbers that also matter to us as patients are things like how many minutes are we actually waiting for our doctor in the waiting room before we're seen? How many days, weeks, months does it take to get the appointment that we've called in a timely compliant, in finger quotes, fashion? How many months are we waiting to actually get the follow-up appointment? So the numbers that matter to us are the ones that actually have context. I can't look at $8 billion or even hear the word $8 billion. If I looked at $8 billion, that would be a whole different story. But if I'm trying to conceptualize $8 billion, that doesn't mean anything to me. But when somebody says to me that their blood sugar is 329, that means something. That, that number resonates. I can't think in these huge terms. It has to actually matter to us for us to start to make changes. So let's make changes. How many of you are familiar with the concept of a desire line? Okay. Oh, good. Nick is. Thank you, Nick. Um, this is an example of a desire line. So in healthcare, well, let me tell you what a desire line is first. Uh, so let me give you an example from Sweden. In Sweden, one of the things that they do is actually pretty interesting, is when it snows, they don't clear the pass and they watch where people walk. And then they compare where people walk when the snow melts to where they walked when there was snow on the ground, and they see where did people actually go? What path did they choose to, to walk to get to where they were going? You build the sidewalk, and you see my connection already, or the system to the place that people are going. You don't build it to where you think they're going to go you build it to where they're actually going. In healthcare, as I already started off with, one of the things that we've done, it's, it's been unfortunate, is that we've built this system. We've built many tools. We have wonderful things like, well, not so wonderful in times, EHRs that are built around the wrong thing. There is a desire line that exists out there in healthcare, and patients walk it every day. But they're forced to walk this path and not the one that they really want. So when we think about um, how, you know, what is that next great thing in healthcare that's going to allow us to change the world? Are we thinking about the path that we've already built? Or are we thinking about the path that the patients are walking on? And I'm up again because I love Greek mythology. <laughs> I don't really love Greek mythology. I think it's apropos to the conversation. I know. Um, so Icarus. We in healthcare, again, as we attempt to create this new system, we do have to be careful of a couple of things. You remember the Icarus story, right? How many of you remember that one? Hopefully more. Good. Thank you. Okay, so Icarus and his dad, you know, got the wings, trying to escape, and then he flew too close to the sun because he was a cocky 12-year-old kid. And he fell into the ocean, and it didn't work out well for him. We do have to temper some of our enthusiasm in healthcare. And we have to ground some of our decisions in not only what the patient wants, which we'll conclude with a recommendation about this in a second, but also what the evidence suggests. And this is a fine balance. If you look at some of the research that's been done out there, it's been great, and we've heard a lot of it for the past two days. But there's a huge disconnect between what's done in research and then what's implemented in practice. And sometimes that disconnect, in, along the way of trans translating into actual practice, it misses the point of why we are doing it in the first place which is that we were doing it to help somebody's life a little bit better. So we just want to temper some of our excitement here. We're excited, right? With that, you know, you can't fly too close to the sun too quickly, and we don't want to do that. So what we need is sunscreen. So we can do the waxy wing bit. I'm sorry, I don't mean to make it more layman, but we can have our waxy wings. We can try to get close to the sun, but we need to take some precautionary measures to make sure that we actually don't have our wings melt off and we fall tumbling down into the ocean. Yeah, it got rough. I don't want any of that. So Ben and I, uh, you know, we're done with Greek mythology. We want to move towards solutions. If you are looking to actually make an impact, I mean, we had a couple of different ideas that we wanted to share about things that we can do now, not, oh, this is hypothetical stuff we can think about when we leave. These are things that you can do when you leave. It's not a wish list. It's a to-do list. So first and foremost, I know we're talking about some mobile apps in this room. It's, it's important for people who are putting together a team to develop a new solution, a healthcare solution, mobile solution, a combination of those two things. Don't, don't just make these apps for the sake of having an app. I mean, in my house, we call that being an app hole. You don't just do these things to be able to say that you've done them. Make it so that it matters. Have patients on your development teams, your end users or whatever phrase fits best for these people, the people that will actually benefit from your product, make sure that they actually benefit from it by including them in the design process. Actually, the whole process. And to stick with that first recommendation, it's not just in the design of tools, but it's also in the design of your research. 
It's in the design of how you deliver clinical care. Have the patients there at the beginning and ask them, what's most important to you that we study? Don't just come in with your best idea. Ask them what's important to them. Second recommendation, uh, consistent with what Carrie was saying, we also need to fund projects that really look at enhancing the patient experience and, and what the patient wants. Uh, we've heard a little bit over the last two days about opportunities for funding mechanisms that do allow for us to study more patient-centered patient centered care. But really, I think this is, uh, it's, it's almost a little bit contingent on some of our funding agencies, and I'm an academic, and I'm reliant on these funding agencies, so I will say this out loud and very proud, but there's a lot of folks that fund the work that we do that focus in on such minuscule things that aren't relevant to patients that it, it's a little bit sad. It's a little bit appalling. We need to be thinking about how can our funding agencies support good behavior, and when individuals are applying for grants that have to do with the patient and what the patient wants, it may not necessarily be the most rigorous RCT you've ever seen, but it might actually help the patient who came up with the idea. And in keeping with that theme, and I feel like this is something that I can talk about in this closed room, well, closed, technically it's being broadcast, but semi-closed room, if we are putting together conferences like this, it is, it's not just important to have patients in attendance, it's crucial and it should become mandatory. So things like, reduced rates for patients, having scholarships for patients, people who are there representing disease advocacy or some kind of patient perspective, those people shouldn't be just encouraged to attend, but they should be assisted in attending because a lot of times patients don't have the pocketbooks or the wallets that they're able to dip into that allow for this sort of, uh, sort of interaction. So it's very, I mean, we have patients in the room and this doesn't go against the whole we are all patients. We are all patients, but some of us are making Salaries that may be more commiserate in spending uh, for conference registrations versus other those of us might need a little assistance. So if you're putting together meetings, make sure just as you're when you're putting together your innovation teams, putting together your conferences, remember to include the people that you're actually saying that you want to serve. Have us in the room. We're reasonably polite. Final recommendation. Um, we want to come back a little bit to the point of data. And we want to start to talk about conversations in our communities, in our healthcare communities, about what works best for the patient. So whether it's comparing head-to-head -head applications that have to do with diabetes on your phone, whether it's looking at practices that might be a little bit more patient-friendly. Uh, you know, again, I go back, Carrie and I talked about this uh, quite a bit, that, you know, I'm a researcher, and so when I look at data, I use data as a way to inform process. And I have no problems comparing practice A to practice B on certain outcomes and getting them to learn from each other and push each other to be better. You call it benchmarking. Okay, what happens when we start to benchmark some of these really important patient measures? And when the patients are made aware of this and the providers see that the patients do care and they make the decisions based on some of those data. Now, granted, in a perfect world, people would just be able to go to wherever they want and get health care from whoever they want. But we know that we don't have an a perfect health care system. So we have a little bit of work to, there, to do there. But the point is, that we can use evidence and patients can see that evidence to inform what they choose to do. Let's vote for patient-centeredness. Let's vote with our research and see what actually does help the patient and what they want, not just what may give you a better outcome. That was so nice, Ben. I actually think we might have hit the close. What? That's the close, right? So these are, these are things that you can do today, right now. These are things that you can do as a patient. If you're sitting in the doctor's office, allow yourself to ask the questions, empower yourself to be the one that challenges or demands better information. Even if you can't pick a different provider, make sure that the provider that you're with actually provides something to you. So these are things that you can do when you leave. And if you don't do them, ask yourselves why. Why isn't this important to you? Because at the end of the day, we are all patients. So don't think that you're um, absolved of not having to deal with some of these issues. So thank you very much. And I'm not sure if we have questions or.